Well, as you, you can see the title and um, it's really, this is, this is a subject that uh, I find very compelling because the term memory loss has become so widespread. And in fact, not only in professional circles, but among people who are care partners, people who have no connection directly with anyone with dementia, uh, but it's sort of understood that people with dementia have memory loss. And this can, at least in my opinion, this is not only potentially uh, problematic for everyone, but it's also incoherent in a certain way because actually, what does it mean? Uh, and that's something we have to start to un unpack. So what I'd like to do is ask you, um, why is the term memory loss used in the first place? <clears throat> well, let's look at, at some of the, um, the reasons for that. And so you, you're probably familiar with all of these, but I'll, I'll just set this up anyway. Uh, well, people repeatedly ask the same questions that have been answered already. So it, it seems as though they don't remember that they have asked the question and they don't remember that you've answered it. People fail to recall the names of loved ones or the name of the relationship, their relationships to them um, or special dates in the family's history, having met someone a few moments ago. Now, it's really kind of interesting. You notice right away that the fourth word in the second bullet point is recall. And it's really important that you keep that word in mind because as you'll see, most of the time, um, people would say that individuals fail to remember the names of loved ones. But I'm using the term recall here because it's much more accurate as you'll come to see. And it's really important to keep the difference in mind. Now, people fail to recall where they put this or that object and they may accuse someone of having stolen the object. <clears throat> you know, I mean, it's so typical, typical stories of of a, a married couple, one has is living with dementia and puts something in a particular place, fails to recall where he or she put it. No one else lives there. And so says to the spouse, what did you do? Where did you put my, did you take my, you know, whatever. <clears throat> so this is, a, again, you notice the word recall is being used here. So memory loss is frequently used to describe these kinds of problems as well as others. But the questions and the two questions I'd like to focus on, and, and you know, I mean, it, it's sort of funny that I'm asking the question, is this a correct description? Well, if the answer to that question was yes, then we could all go home and there would be no point in my, in my continuing. So obviously I'm going to tell you that the answer is no. And, uh, and then try to get to the question. And I think I will, why is this important? So in order to do this, we have to begin to understand that if people with dementia have something called memory loss, it's often assumed that they can't make new memories and therefore they can't be affected by what happens to them in the here and now. That is how they're treated by others, such as being unwittingly spoken about in unflattering, disparaging ways. Common courtesy is frequently suspended, which is depersonalizing and assaults people's feelings of self-worth. The kinds of actions that Tom Kitt would call malignant social psychology. Now, what's curious about this, and again, is a very important word here, unwittingly, that is, in, in, people do this without real, innocently, nobody is trying to hurt anybody else. But the assumption is, well, I can say, I can talk about my spouse to the physician in ways that I would never talk about my spouse in his or her presence because my spouse can't, won't remember it anyway. So I will then do it, <clears throat> excuse me. And the problem here is that, <clears throat> and let me just play this out for you. Suppose one assumes <laughs> the person won't remember it anyway. And then that's something that would be offensive or hurtful if 
you assume the person could remember. <clears throat> but then the person soon thereafter becomes very angry. And if you assume that the person can't, has memory loss and can't make new memories, then the anger can't be righteous indignation. It has to be irrational hostility because that plays into the narrative of dysfunction. That is, if a person can't make new memories and I just said something that's, that's very disturbing or hurtful and the person doesn't remember it or can't remember it, then the person's anger can't be connected to what I did, but has to be for reasons that I don't understand. And it's probably a disease driven problem. Does that make sense to you? Just nod if, 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 if that's clear. Okay. So it's important to explore the question of whether or not people with dementia can make new memories and retrieve, and retrieve old ones because we may have failed to appreciate some important facts about how memory works and what is often preserved in people with Alzheimer's or other types of dementia. So let's just go through very briefly stages of memory. This is, this is right out of introductory psychology courses and textbooks. And, and cognitive psychologists talk about these things frequently. And, and this, there's nothing very arcane about this, but there's one stage of memory that's called encoding. And, and usually this is some process, which is not at all clear. There, there are no definitive answers to exactly how this occurs, but some of the theories involved is that are that, that there is some kind of electrical, neuroelectric series of events so that you're for example, you're hearing my voice right now, and, and the, the, your ability to hear my voice is uh, connected intimately with the actions of your auditory nerve and the temporal lobes of your brain, and, and neuroelectric events are traveling from the sense, sensory organ to the rest of the brain. And somehow, and electrically, and then perhaps chemically, these events are then created so that they can last for a, a period of time or a very long, a shorter period of time or a very long period of time. Now, the, the next stage is something called storage. And so there are really two, two parts to this. There's something called working memory or short-term memory and long-term memory. You know, working memory, uh, you know, I, I, was giving, I was giving a lecture once to about, the, about this to a group of people who were retired. So they were all over 55 years of age. So now uh, probably none of you is, or maybe a couple of you might be, but, but I, I just want to give you an example of the example I gave them, which provoked incredible laughter before I even finished the example. So the example was, I started to say, well, okay, suppose you're in, in one room of your house and, um, and you're doing something, it's maybe it's in your bedroom or it's in, in the, in the uh, washroom or, or somewhere. And, and you say, well, I need to go to the kitchen and take care of something. But you continue to do whatever it is you're doing in the room you're in. And a few minutes later, you go into the kitchen. And before I even said another word, this whole audience started laughing. Because what I was about to say was, and you get into the kitchen, you say, okay, why am I here? <laughs> and, but everybody in that audience had had that experience. You can go, there, okay, well, okay, I know I came here for a reason, but what is it? And the problem here is that you're not recalling the reason for your having gone to the kitchen. And maybe you stand there for a few minutes or maybe, or maybe a minute or so, and you look around and, and then, suddenly you recall why you came there. So working memory, and you, in fact, you're using working memory right now as you're listening to what I'm saying, because if I pause and think and look pensive and then come back to what I was saying about working memory, you, will have, you, you won't say, well, what the hell was he talking? What has this got to do with anything? because your working memory is lasting long enough for you to connect one sentence with another and the ideas that have been pre presented to you in a very short period of time. Now, somehow, in some cases, what was in working memory can be changed into something that is very, very long lasting. So if somebody asked me where I was and what I was doing, 
on September 10th, 2001, I would probably have a very difficult time. Well, I could tell you where I was in a way because I, I knew where I was on the 11th, but I could tell you a lot of detail about, about September 11th, 2001 when the, the buildings in New York and, and, um, were, and, and uh, Washington, D.C. Were, were attacked by the Al-Qaeda terrorists. And I can tell you a great deal about that. If you ask me about November 22nd, 1961, which uh, reveals that I'm not um, 27 years old, uh, I could tell you that I, I know exactly where I was on November 22nd, 1961. That was the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. If you ask me what I was doing and where I was on the 10th, on the, I'm sorry, the 21st or the, the 20th, I have no idea. I, I, I could tell you generally where I was, but I couldn't tell you much about the day's events. So some kinds of events become emblazoned in long-term memory and can be retrieved by recall and, or sometimes with through other methods, which we'll get to in a second, because now we have to talk about retrieval because something can be encoded and stored, but now the problem is to retrieve it. And so how do we retrieve memories? And it, it's kind of like um, when you think about your computer, if you, your computer has information in it and, and suppose you, for, you don't know where a particular file is, well, then you have to do something to find it. But if you enter the wrong words that you'll never find that file you have to put in exactly the right words right so you have to kind of cue the computer in a way but retrieval can happen in a couple of different ways and so let's look at them there's one type of retrieval that's called the explicit type and there are two versions of this there's recall and recognition so in both cases there is one and only one correct answer to a question. So if I asked you, what did you have for breakfast today? There's one and only one correct answer. If I asked you what day of the week today is, there's one and only one correct answer. Now, if I ask you that question, uh, you, can, you, you have to recall it. Now, recall is something, is a process that becomes more and more difficult, it seems, as we age. So and I can tell you from my own experience that um, um, friends of mine and, and my wife will tell you that I seem to have innumerable frivolous facts in my head about things that no one cares about. And uh, there was a time when I could recall them like this. And there are times now when I, I, I know I know it, but OK, now what do you care? And maybe if, if I don't think about it, a few minutes later, it will come to me. Maybe it's three o'clock in the morning, it'll come to me and I'll wake her up and tell her what it was. And she doesn't appreciate that apparently. But, um, <clears throat> but so recall is more difficult. It's kind of like fill in the blank questions on a test or writing an essay. Recognition is, is more akin to a multiple choice test where the answer is there and you don't have to recall it as much as you need to recognize it when you see it. So what did you have for breakfast today? I don't know. <laughs> well, not, you're not recalling it, right? Now, if I gave you a few, a few possibilities, then you might be able to get the correct answer to that very easily because you recognize it, which is a much simpler process. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's a, now the, this other type of retrieval, I mean, this is really important to what's going to follow. It's called the implicit type. It's called implicit memory. It's called the implicit type of retrieval. The textbook definition is what you see. It's a change in behavior due to an experience person may not recall having had. Now that doesn't seem intuitive, I think. I mean, how, how can you... How can your experience be changed by, an, by how can your, your behavior be changed by an experience that you don't recall even having had in the first place? Well, you can show this sort of thing with people with dementia, but I'll give you a couple of examples of how it could be demonstrated. One type of demonstration is called a word stem completion task. So in this case, and I'll give you an example of a person, persons with dementia, <clears throat> Excuse me. And what happens here is that the person is looking at a, like, say, a computer screen, 
or a, a hard copy of a list of, a list of words and is asked to study the list of words or look at the screen study the list of words and is given time to look at the words and study them and, and try to remember them now after the person has the time to do this uh, sometime they'll maybe there'll be a little conversation about this or that and some kind of distraction task if you will Not, nothing too intense but but something that prevents you from keeping on rehearsing and and then the person will be shown a word stem which is what you see here def so for, that's an example of a word stem so the, the the question posed to the person now the person with dementia now is i would like you to you see this these first three letters and you see a blank line i would like you to fill in the blank to make a word that you saw on the screen or on the list that you studied. Now, oftentimes, very frequently, the person with dementia will say, what list? So the person is not recalling having seen a list of words. So if you say, complete this with the letters that form a word that you saw on the list previously, there's one and only one correct answer to that question. Uh, but instead of asking the question that way, or in addition to asking the question that way, you say, would you please fill in this blank to make the first word that comes to your mind? In that case, the person in this, in this particular instance would write E-N-D to make the word defend, and defend was on the list. <laughs> now, the, the people who do these experiments are very careful not to use words that, there there's only one possible word but the word the def is, a, is the beginning of a whole host of words so it's really easy to be wrong and difficult to be right the odds are against you to be in guessing but the person with dementia when asked to fill this in to make the first word that comes to your mind does it correctly now the thing about this is and i and i want to harken back to what you saw up here there's one and only one correct answer to a question. When you ask the person to make the first word that comes to your mind, now clearly the first word that comes, there is no one and only one correct answer to that question. The first word that came to your mind is the first word that came to your mind. You can't be incorrect about that any more than you could be incorrect about the answering the question, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? If I asked you, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? And you said chocolate. And I said, no, it isn't. That would be absurd. So <laughs> it, it, it's incorrigible. What, the first word that came to your mind is the first word. It's, you can't be right or wrong about that. We can be right about it. You can't be wrong. Another type of task is called homophone spelling. Now, this is obviously in English, <clears throat> you probably have versions in German. I, I, I don't know them, unfortunately. Um, but if you ask people out of just off the top of their heads, Without, without any pre preceding discussion, please spell the word read for me. They would say, in, certainly in this country, R-E-A-D, because that's the most common spelling of that word. R-E-E-D is not common at all. Now, perhaps if the person was a musician, you would have a different type of answer, but let me give you an example of how this can play out. Use the example of a man called Clive Wearing. And I don't know, perhaps some of you know who Clive Wearing was, but uh, just in case anybody doesn't, he was uh, his British fellow who uh, was a, a very uh, accomplished scholar of medieval choral music. And he actually led a group, a choir, in, in singing medieval choral music. Unfortunately, what happened with Clive Wearing was that he had a very terrible case of encephalitis that created what many people would call memory loss. But so, and in his case, it was a type of memory problem. It's called anterograde amnesia. So that he didn't seem to remember things that happened now. He could remember things from the past. So, so here, is he, he'll give you an example of what happened. He was in a film 
and he's in a hospital and he gets up and he's writing in his his journal diary and he's writing it is 8 30 a.m i am conscious for the first time today i am alive he writes this and you, you can see three hours later his wife comes to see him she enters the room oh hello darling how are you he says to her he recognizes her he knows who she is and they're having a chat and she notices on the table in his room there's the open page to what he had written that i just mentioned and she says darling you you and he says, oh, before she says anything, he says, oh, darling, I'm so happy to see you. I'm conscious for the first time today. And now she notices that he wrote three hours earlier, I'm conscious for the first time today. So she shows him this and says, but darling, you, you, were, you, you said you were conscious for the first time three hours ago. Now, he does not recall having written that. He does recognize his own writing. And now he's in a situation of great turmoil. He doesn't recall having done this, but he knows it's his. This is scary. And this is where some phenomenology comes in. You know, it's really very scary. I mean, can you imagine you wrote something, you recognize your own writing, have no re recollection of having done that. This is some cruel game. And so he gets upset. And the way he evinces his uh, being upset is he says, Use your reason, woman. I'm telling you I'm conscious for the first time today. <laughs> and he's really right. Okay. So suppose, and this is a hypothetical, although I, I know I have great confidence that this would work out. It, it works out with other people with memory problems, but I'm using Clive so that it's, it's alive for you. So that Clive is alive. Um, if I went into this fellow's room and started chatting with him, and um, you know, I, I'm, as a professional, and I, we started talking about musical instruments, uh, especially reed instruments. And so there's the bassoon, there's the oboe, um, there's oh, uh, what else is a reed instrument? I mean, somebody knows what another reed instrument is. But in any event, uh, you always notice when you go to the symphony that that the bassoonist or the oboist, when they're not playing will pull the reed out of the instrument and clear it and get saliva out, what have you. And they'll put the reed back in because the reed is what vibrates and that helps create the sound that the instrument makes. So if Clive Wearing and I were talking about reed instruments for a short time, and then somebody came to the door of the room and, and, and asked me to come out for a brief chat, if I went out of the room, and spent two, three minutes chatting with that person and then came back into the room and said to Clive Wearing, okay, now what were we talking about? He would look at me and say, I have no, I've never met you before in my life. I don't know what you're talking about. So he has no recollection of having met me or even chatted with me. But if I then said to him, would you, would you please do me a favor and spell read? He'd say R-E-E-D. If we hadn't had that conversation about reed instruments and I asked him to spell reed, he'd say R-E-A-D. So he's made a, his behavior, oops, his behavior has changed due to an experience he doesn't recall having had. Yes? Okay. So let's look at some cases of people with Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and I'll give you examples of how this plays out. Mr. D and the lawnmower. Mr. D had been diagnosed with dementia some years earlier, still living at home with his wife. And they had a garden and uh, in the back of the house, there was a, a little shed where they kept the gardening tools, including a lawnmower. And he, he was his, it was his job, if you will. And he liked it, cutting the grass and, and do, shaping out the, the shrubs and the flowers. His wife, uh, for reasons that were not clear at all, um, became very upset with him using the lawnmower because she was afraid that he might cause some damage or hurt himself. So she put a lock on the door of the shed so that he couldn't open the door and get the lawnmower out. But now the grass needs to be cut again and he needs to get the lawnmower and there's a lock on the door. So he took a brick and broke the lock off the door 
opened the shed, took the lawnmower and cut the grass with, with no terrible events happening. He did a fine job as always. Now his wife is even more upset. And so she contacts, they had three adult children living in the, in the area. She contacts the oldest one, John, to come and get, take dad's lawnmower to your house, John. I want you to take the lawnmower to your house because I don't want dad using it now because he might hurt himself or damage something. This conversation was between John and Miss, Mrs. D. Mr. D had no part in this, had no idea what was going on. The lawnmower is now gone. The next time the grass needs cutting, Mr. D goes to the shed. The lawnmower is gone, comes into the house and reports to his wife that someone stole the lawnmower. She then informs him, no, no one stole it. I, I, John, I gave it to John, John took it to his house because I'm afraid that if you use it, you'll hurt yourself and cause some damage, okay? Five days later, it's Sunday, and the three adult children come for dinner with Mr. and Mrs. D. The youngest arrives first, and Mr. D gives him hugs. The, the, the middle one, the second one arrives, the next, next, next oldest arrives second, gives her hugs, kisses, John is the third to arrive. John arrives. Mr. D won't look at him and won't talk to him. And Mrs. D asks her husband, are you angry with John? And Mr. D says, yeah. And she says, why? And he says, I don't know. Now, he made a memory of having been disenfranchised by John and his wife. And he's angry about it, but he can't recall the details. He made a memory of the feeling of his indignation, but he doesn't recall the details of what happened. Now, if you don't know about implicit memory, then Mrs. D could easily report to the physician that he got angry with his son, John, for no reason. Mrs. E at the adult day center. Mrs. E was a, a lovely person. I, I, she knew, we knew each other. I, I would go to the day center a few days a week. And <clears throat> I'm, she had dementia. And every now and then I would just run through a couple of things with her, like a three-stage command. Just so you understand, the three-stage command would be, an example would be, I would say to her, take this piece of paper, fold it in half, take this piece of paper, fold it in half and put it on the floor. Three stage command. Now she could take it in her hand and then she would hand it back to me. So I mean, she couldn't do the three stages. So one day uh, it was, they was, lunch had been served and it was coming to an end and, and staff people were uh, clearing the tables. And, um, and I saw Mrs. D was walking toward me and I said, I asked him saying hello, and I said, could you do me a favor? And could you go over to Frank, one of the other participants? Could you go over to Frank, pick up his tray and empty it into the trash, please? She did it. So this is, a, this is something in context, right? It wasn't something out of context. It was within a social situation which is not really the, the main point of this example. The main point of this example is that two days later, I came back to the center, the, the day center, and lunch was coming to an end. And Mrs. E comes over to me and says, do you have something for me to do? And I said, like what? And she said, I don't know. Now, I had been there for years. I was there all the time. She knew who I was. And she had never come over to me after lunch and said, do you have something for me to do until then? So I had asked her to do me a favor two days earlier. It wasn't really often that anyone asked her to do him or her a favor. So this was something that she enjoyed doing. She did the three-stage command in a social context and she made a memory of me having done something that asked her to do something, but she couldn't remember, or couldn't recall the details. Dr. B at the Adult Day Center. So this, this is a, he was a retired professor of actually science. 
And uh, I spent two years with him. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, right? Nine months with him, two days a week, two hours at a time. And we were engaged in a, in a conversation. Uh, really, I was trying to learn his experience. And we would always meet in a particular room at the day center. And one particular week, we couldn't meet in our typical room, which was empty otherwise. We, we would meet in that room because no one else was there. But this one time, the, the day center was part of a, of a hospital. It was in a different building from the hospital, but it was part that was owned and operated by the hospital. And so on this one occasion, the room in which Dr. B and I would usually meet was being occupied by people, other people in the day center. And so we had to go down the hall and use a different room, which happened to be empty. So we did. This is a Thursday. And so we, we were in that room and we had our usual meeting and finished. Uh, he didn't come back to the day center until the next Monday or Tuesday. I didn't come back until the next Tuesday. So five days later, I came back. And when I got there, this, some of the staff people told me that Dr. B had been raising some kind of chaos, ruckus, some storm was going on with Dr. B. And I, I said, well, what was it? And they said, well, he went down the hall to the room where you met last time. And there were some people in the room and he was trying to kick them out because we had a meeting in there. <laughs> now, he made a memory of us having met there and he kept it for five days. And I remember saying to him, well, how, how is it that you, you did that? Why did you do that? And he said, well, I don't know. I, there was something important about it. <laughs> so he made a memory of something that was important to him. So many months later, he, was, he had to go to a nursing home. And uh, when he, in the first day or so of his being there, when he would walk through a doorway, there was a, a little riser or the threshold in the door leading into the hall and he would almost trip over it so he wasn't picking up his foot high enough to get over the little riser in, on the floor well after this happened a few times uh he started picking up his foot high enough even when there wasn't any riser in the doorway so he made a memory of doing that even though he had dementia and was now in a nursing home. So he was able to make a memory of, he was doing something different because he could have tripped and fallen. So he learned to pick up his foot higher. Mrs. D and meeting at the church, Mrs. D had dementia and she was in a support group. I was co-leading the support group for people with dementia. She had, was a retired teacher and she was really a terrific person. And I wanted to interview her privately. And so I said to her after the support group meeting, I, I, I would like to do that if it was okay with her. And, and it was. And so the support group met at the church, a particular church, and she knew where she'd still drive. She could still drive. And she, and she lived close by, but she knew where the church was. And that was fine. And so she gave me her phone number and I contacted her to set up a time to meet. And so I phoned her and, and we were having conversation and, and she, so I said, uh, okay, well, how about if we set up a, a, a time and day to meet? She said, great. I said, well, how about tomorrow at 10 o'clock at the church? And she said, wonderful. And then we started talking about something else. Now, about three minutes later, she said, well, don't you think we ought to decide when we're going to meet? And I said, yes, that's a really great idea. How about 10 o'clock at the church tomorrow? And she said, terrific, wonderful. And we started talking about something else. And three, four minutes later, well, don't you think we ought to decide when we're going to meet? And, and I said, yeah, it's a great idea. How about 10 o'clock at the church tomorrow? This went on like four or five more times. So maybe six times she kept on asking this question, clearly not recalling she had asked it and clearly not recalling that I had answered it. So maybe the sixth or seventh time she said, so, okay, so what time are we going to meet? And I said, take a guess. And she said, 10. And I said, that's right. 
So if I had said to her, what time did I tell you? There's one and only one correct answer. Now, oh my God, he told me, I can't. And then she, she could have rightly said, what time did I tell you? And she, she could have rightly said to me, listen, professor, you know, if I, could, if I knew that, I wouldn't be asking you this question now, would I? But no, she didn't say that. She, she, I said, take a guess. And she gets 10. Now think about it. If, suppose for the sake of discussion, there's 12 hours of daylight time, more or less in a day. And suppose, um, and, and well, then, then she had, and, and suppose we had decided to meet on the hour, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock. She had a one in 12 chance of guessing correctly. But who said we we're going to meet on the hour? It could have been on the half hour. So her, the odds against her guessing correctly were enormous, but she did guess correctly, even though she couldn't recall what we had been talking about. The Muslim woman in a nursing home, she had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's type dementia. She <clears throat> had been married and widowed 10 years earlier, and uh, the marriage was a very good one, and according to the way she practiced her religion, she not only didn't she have a romantic relationship with another man in those 10 years, but, but she, she didn't have any dates or anything like social gathering with any other man. Her son lived in the area and was her primary care partner. She's now living in a nursing home, and uh, this nursing home was arranged so that the halls were all the same colors. So sometimes in nursing homes, at least here, the hallways can be different colors to give residents cues as to which hall they, they, their room is. So in any event, in her chart, uh, it was noted for the staff that, that they should at night they should check on her every 10 minutes or so because she had a habit of getting up and walking around. And, uh, this, and that, that was done usually, but this particular night, no one did that. So no one came by every 10 minutes or so to make sure she was there or look for her, <clears throat> excuse me. And she happened to get up and she was walking around and she walked into apparently another hallway and into a room that was occupied by a younger man who had a history of, of sexual aggression and he raped her. And there was screams and then the staff came and you know he, he raped her. In the immediate aftermath, she, she begged them not to tell her son. She was totally ashamed and, and outraged. With some, they had to tell her son, of course. And um, every now and then in the days that followed, the weeks that followed, she would just start crying for no apparent reason. The son brought a lawsuit against the nursing home and asked and, and the, the lawyers for the nursing home asked the judge to dismiss the case as frivolous, um, not that being raped is frivolous, but the point that the lawyers were trying to make was the, for the nursing home was that it's a frivolous case because she has Alzheimer's dementia and memory loss. So she couldn't remember, she couldn't possibly remember having been raped. So there would be no lasting harm done to her. So you see, when you assume that memory loss is, a, is an actual thing, the, the sequelae, what can come out of this, could be something as incredible as that. Effect of cueing with General Yu. General Yu was a long-term uh, US Army veteran. He, got, he was drafted into the Army years and years earlier, stayed in for 36 years. <clears throat> very, very nice guy, just beloved by people who, who worked with him, served with him. And he's now diagnosed with dementia. And his wife uh, contacted me and we asked me to come to dinner at their house. And I did. And they had three children, three adult children, one of whom was visiting from out of town and she's a nurse. So we had dinner, the, the, the four of us, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Yu made baked salmon and some vegetables and salad, and it was delicious. And I was having, having conversation with General Yu. He was delightful, and, and when I could make contact with him, 
with all kinds of different things between, about the army and sports and things like that. We had a really pleasant time. And then the, the two women start to clear the table after the first course of dinner, or, or the main course. And uh, the general looks at me and says, I see, I, I don't even know what I had for dinner. And I said, well, I don't know about that. Let's see. Did you have chicken? And he said, no, I, I, I think it was fish. And I said, exactly right. It was, it was salmon. And then he turns to his wife and daughter and says, when's this guy coming back here again? Now, the thing is, he, he said he couldn't, he didn't know, but he did know. He, he couldn't recall it immediately. But when I gave him something to cue off of, was it chicken? Now he's in the fish. They now is narrowing it down. He gets it. The effect of using a multiple choice format with Mr. R and others in the orient and other orientation question in a hospital clinic and Mrs. DL being asked my name at support group meeting. Mr. R came to be tested at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Alzheimer's outpatient clinic. I was the neuropsychologist who was administering tests one day a week there. They were doing drug studies. A typical orientation question on the mini mental state exam, uh, including what day of the week is it? And so I asked Mr. R, okay, what, what day of the week is this? And he says, I don't know. Okay, well, I've got to write that down. So out of just sheer curiosity, I said, well, okay, is it Saturday? No. Is it Tuesday? No. Is it Thursday? Yeah. And it was. So he couldn't recall what day of the week it was, but he could recognize the correct answer when he heard it. So my point with him and then with Mrs. DL, who I came to the support group meeting the first time to talk about memory and giving examples of multiple choice and, and recall. And, um, and at, the end of the, uh, at the end of what I was saying, Mrs. DL says, okay, now, tell me about that again. What, what is that the multiple choice thing? I said, well, okay, let me give you an example. I said, what's my name? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, okay, let me, let me do it another way. And I gave her four choices, each beginning with the letter S and each rather short. The first one, she said no. The second one, she said no. The third one, she said, let me hold on to that. And the fourth one, she said no. The third one that she wanted to hold on to was my name. So she recognized it when she, in a way, she recognized it when she saw it or heard it, but she couldn't recall it. So in all of these examples, we see that it's possible for people with dementia to gain access to memories they have made, but not through the process of recall or the recall of specific details. So, <clears throat> excuse me, given all of this, how do we, what do we make of it all? So one thing, so what we conclude, recalling is not the same as remembering. So don't say, and by the way, US politicians are famous. That, you know, it's really kind of funny when, when the US politicians are being asked about some serious matters, and they'll always say, I don't recall. No one ever says, I don't remember, but they say, I don't recall. They've been cued, they've been coached because you might remember if you got, gave them a multiple choice test or, you know, but, oh, but I don't recall. You know, they all have these recall problems, even though they haven't been diagnosed with dementia yet. <clears throat> one may still remember, even though one is unable to recall because one might still be able to recognize the correct answer via multiple choice format. And implicit memory systems can still function. That is the change in behavior due to experiences that you don't recall having had. So memory loss is not an accurate descriptor of people with Alzheimer's or other types of dementia. They haven't lost previous memories. They haven't lost the ability to make new ones. They haven't lost the ability to retrieve new ones entirely. So to say that they have memory loss is just not accurate. And, and this becomes really important because how would we treat someone if we thought they couldn't remember anything? Would it be different if they could remember things that were important to them and had memory systems still, would we treat them differently if we thought they could remember things that were important to them and had memory systems that still worked? That is, 
would like any of us who are healthy, would there be a difference? If so, might the difference matter to a loved one or to you? So <clears throat> recommendations, treat people diagnosed with dementia with common courtesy, know that they can make new memories and act on the basis of those memories, even if their ability to recall is dysfunctional. Don't put people in a position to fail. What do you have for breakfast? What's today's date? Yeah, that happens all the time. You know, the, the, the spouse will say, what did you have for breakfast an hour later? I don't know. And now who cares? I mean, why is what I had for breakfast important to you? I mean, did you ever ask me that question ever in our 50 years of being married? No, but now the reason you're asking that question is because if I answer it correctly, you will feel better. But it's, it's inconsequential, it's absurd. What's today's date? Well, you know what? I don't know. I mean, even I have to get this out to see, to see what today's date is half the time, because if I don't have a meeting or I don't have to be someplace, I, I might not know what the date is. So these kinds of questions are things that are relatively inconsequential and require to use explicit recall, which is a weak suit for them. Assume that what you do and say can affect the person with dementia and that they can make new memories, even if shown only implicitly. If a person repeats previously asked and answered questions, don't say, I just told you that, or what did I just tell you? Because the person isn't recalling that fact. Instead, you might say, take a guess or use a multiple choice format. In any case, it's very important to maintain a non-anxious presence. Most of us can be very reactive to heightened anxiety in others, and that will not help that person retrieving information from memory. It doesn't help us. When we start obsessing about something, it, 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 I don't know if any of you remember taking exams, but when you, I mean, I've seen students, they're sitting there obsessing about a question, and I would go over, I'd just like, move on, move on to something else. It'll come to you. You just can't be thinking about it all the time. So heightened anxiety is, is, the worst thing to, to, to create because that impedes re recollection even more. Remember that people diagnosed can be embarrassed and upset about recall problems and try to cover them up. And that is a sign of mental health. They try to present themselves with the best in the best possible way. If, you, if you're ashamed of something that, that, that about your, yourself and you try not to reveal it, that's, that's a positive thing. You're, you're reflecting on the value of something and you're saying, oh gosh, I don't want to feel that way to other people. That's a sign of mental health. So treat people as if they re still retain pride and self-respect. Remembering that self-respect and the capacity for embarrassment and shame is more important than more complex cognitively than being able to recall today's date or the day of the week. Maya Angelou, the author was correct. Uh, more or less, she said, people will forget what you said, but people will never forget how you made them feel. People with, with dementia can still remember, so, and so can those who are otherwise healthy. Therefore, make good moments on the basis of the above. Let me give you an example. Making good moments. Now, th this is, this is not, not just, I mean, it's obviously true. We, we should, to the best of our ability, try to make good moments with loved ones who have dementia and with loved ones who don't for that matter. But, but here's an example of how making a good moment um, can really matter. Uh, on July 24th, 2006, I was having conversation with my father. He lived uh, about 250 miles away from here. And he was two weeks past his 96th birthday. And he was living independently in his house. He had macular degeneration and he also had a colon cancer and we were functioning with this. I mean, I, we organized things for him so he had help where he needed it, but he was still taking care of himself in his house where he wanted to be very, very much. And uh, I would talk to him every evening at the same time and that was going on for more than a decade. And then even when my mother was still alive, I mean, every, every night at the same time, I would phone them. And I could be in Europe, I could be across the United States at the same time, I'd always phone at that hour. 
On this particular evening, July 24th, 2006, we had our typical conversation and he, he, he did, you know, he said he wasn't really feeling that great. And, and there was somebody going to be coming in the morning to, to take uh, blood because he had to be transfused for the colon cancer. He's losing blood because of that. And so somebody's coming in the morning to take some blood to check it so he could, we could set up a, a transfusion. And so I said, you know, call me in the morning or have, you know, when that person arrives. But we ended our phone call that night with, with exactly, in exactly the same way that we ended every other phone call that I ever made. And we ended it by my saying, I love you, dad. And him saying, I love you dearly, Steve. And that's where our conversation ended. What I didn't know that night was that was the last conversation. Because somewhere in that night or early in that morning, he died. Now, you know, how many times do we assume we can say something, you know, I wish I would have said, I wish I, and we, all of us go through that. And so I guess I'm trying to say is that making a good moment applies in most every situation, but especially with people who are ill in one way or another. So I have the memory of that last conversation and I will always smile about that. And, and so we just don't know which day is the last day. And so why have to live with regrets about something if we don't have to? So that is, uh, that, at that point, I think um, on that happy note <laughs> or, or inspiring note or, or very, um, oh my God, note, I'll, I'll end and, and say thank you to the people with Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia and their care partners who have been my teachers for the past 40 years, and to you all for your kind attention.